Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for DataCon LA 2022. Um, we're on the track today for on the data infrastructure and security. So this would be the topic today would be for the evolution of AI in cybersecurity. I have Michael Mello, and uh, he'll be talking more in details about uh, information about security, cybersecurity. Thank you, guys. Hi, everybody. So I'm an ambassador for cybersecurity with IBM. I represent all no fee, non, no cost, non sale programs. If you're not taking advantage of those, I encourage you to do so. I, we're the largest enterprise security vendor on the planet. We have, uh, in terms of uh, market share, portfolio, number of employees. So I encourage you to, to take advantage of that. There's all kinds of no cost training, there's no cost workshops. There's uh, user groups. There is also a security leaders roundtable club that I formed with a number of CISOs, and there's a chapter in California if anyone's interested in participating on it. It's called Secret SEC for Security or People Roundtable US. Uh, there's some uh, the website with a little information on there. If you're interested, reach out to me. So. We're going to talk a little bit about AI and the evolution in security, not only in logical security, but physical security as well. Well, we had a gentleman here earlier before this session. He was talking about some of the graphs and, and so forth, and I'll be touching on some of that as well. Trying to advance it. Oops. 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 Maybe now is the market. Great, thank you. So we've seen a lot of problems with the supply chain, certainly. Uh, we uh, we saw that in the supermarkets. We saw it in even buying even automobiles with uh, not having enough technology in there, not enough chips. In fact, even some of the cars are being offered with less features now in order to get these cars even out on the road. We we've been seeing all of these situations. Eighty five percent of the organizations see the. The challenges from uh, from the supply chain. Where we have ninety percent, ninety seven percent of the organizations even prioritizing on how to get around that. It wasn't too long ago when we didn't even have ingredients on products. So let's think back. Well, I can think back. Maybe you can. I'm a little older, but. Uh, it wasn't until the 1960s where we actually even started putting ingredients on products. Then it evolved in the 1980s where we started even putting nutritional facts on the products that we were buying. So it took some evolution to even change the culture. I mean, look at how long it took for even us to start incorporating even seatbelts in our cars. I remember even in the, the beginning, some of my friends were admin said they'll never wear seatbelts. They thought it was safer for them to be tossed from a car instead of being trapped inside the car. Uh, but uh, look at this. I, we, we don't even think about getting in our vehicles nowadays before we put our seatbelt on. So the evolution, the culture changes. We've seen a lot of distrust out of the marketplace. We've seen that with social media. We've seen that with financial institutions. We've seen that with uh, even law enforcement bias. 
So now we start having algorithms even helping us with all of these different solutions. Uh, I mean, how many times uh, we think about a product and then that product comes up on our cell phones or on our laptops in case we want to purchase that. Uh, well, is it that these systems are listening all the time to us or is it a fact that we've done other things that the algorithms have picked up and know that our behavior has shifted towards a particular product as well. Maybe a little of both of that is going on. There's 120 billion hours a year that's being dedicated to low value work for organizations. So what we call AI is not artificial intelligence. We've been shifting that term to augmented intelligence, where the AI is actually assisting the skill set of the people that are using it. Some of the things, some of the pillars in, uh, in trust for AI include more transparency. So there's no longer a time where we can just accept the hypothesis that arise from machine learning or AI and just take it verbatim. Not any longer. We want to understand how it arrived to that. What is their bias included in that decision or that hypothesis? We need it fair and impartial. And we need it based on different corpuses of information. That, that gentleman that was talking earlier was talking about some of the public corpus of information that machine learning and the AI is actually taking into making those decisions and hypothesis. Well, it's not only the public corpus, but there's a private corpus. The, the organizations now identify data as their key intellectual property. It's what distinguishes them from their competitors in the information that they're collecting. That collecting, they're, they are collecting on their own products, their supply chain, and their consumers. And I'll tell you, so if you're not paying for a product, you are the product. So keep that in mind as well. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, cost of, of data breach. So this is a report that's been coming out by the Poneman Institute for the last 17 years. The latest one was just generated and produced uh, about a week ago, mid-week mid last week, for 2022. So IBM happens to be a sponsor of that report for, I think, the last eight years. So they've evaluated 550 breaches internationally across 17 countries. 17 industries as well. Here's some of the key findings. So globally, the average for a data breach is $4.3 million. In the United States, we're a bigger target. So we average almost $10 million per incident for organizations that are being breached today. Healthcare is the highest industry weighs in at 9.4 million. And, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, 10, uh, 10.10 uh, 10 10 for healthcare. So the, the largest cost savings were attributed to machine learning, AI, XCR standing, response and detection, and uh, and then we have uh, incident response. So that constituted to $3 million less for the organizations that have mature life cycles in SCR, AI, and incident response in saving $3 million per incident. There's been a 41% increase in ransomware just in 2022 versus 2021. And the average cost of ransom was 4.5 million, not including the actual ransom pay. In fact, I'll show you some data on that in a little while. 
Zero trust for some of the folks that may be not security savvy here. The, the term zero trust comes from a concept where you don't trust anyone, not even your own employees. Years ago, when you were an employee, you were granted access into your own internet. And if you could be granted that access to your own internet, your own data, it was thought that you could have access to everything that's available in you, inside of your organization. How that was controlled generally was based on, sorry about the feedback, uh, so how that was controlled, a lot of it was largely based on virtual private networks, VPN access. Many of you probably have some means of that on your on your laptops or your home computers, uh, your business computers, and uh, maybe even your cell phones. Again, you probably had to jump through a lot of hoops to get that initially set up. And because you jumped in those hoops, and you went through all that lengthy process to get that those credentials and that authentication inside your network. At that particular time, you granted access to everything again because you went through that process. Now, zero trust is based on the premise that the bad actors are already inside of your network. So, having being granted access inside your own corporate internet is not good enough because they already feel that we have to protect ourselves as if the adversary is already inside of our network. So that's the zero tr trust premise. So it's a heightened level. You know, it really takes the level from uh, the next generation from a least privilege. In the old days, we called it least privileged access. You need to give someone more access than they require because that was an unnecessary risk. Zero trust takes that to the next level. Cloud breaches were the uh, the largest target, and uh, and hybrid clouds. For some of the folks that are not maybe uh, aware of uh, the difference between a public cloud and hybrid cloud, hybrid cloud is, uh, consists of multiple cloud providers as well as your own environment which could be on-prem. So it's a combination of all of that, all of those factors put together. So the hybrid breaches were a million dollars less per incident. And my attribute to that would be that these bad actors, we used to call it, or we used to laugh about it in the old days called security by obscurity, because you, it was nonsense. You couldn't hide uh, stuff because the bad actors were going to be good at finding it. So it, it was it was uh, irrelevant, security by obscurity. But now in a hybrid cloud environment, your data is scattered. In fact, you are probably even have, if you have a hybrid environment, you're having challenges even on your own in trying to find your own data and try to piece that together from different silos that you have in your organization. So how how are the bad actors even able, if you can't even piece all of your data from all the different cloud providers and, uh, and you're on-prem and all into some kind of holistic look, then uh, certainly the bad actors are having some of those challenges as well. The remote workforces that many of us are still engaged in constituted to a million dollars more per incident. And since, especially since COVID, the, these are the organizations that weren't geared for remote work workforces before the pandemic. These were the ones that were kind of thrown into the mix. And then at this point, now the culture has shifted. Even a lot of the uh, candidates that we hire are even driving and forcing organizations to maintain some level of remote access to many of the organizations today for your students that are maybe graduating, you'll, you'll see you have, you're empowered uh, quite a bit more than, uh, than the candidates of, uh, of uh, yesteryears. So some more statistics around the, the Poneman Institute cost of data breach. So uh, your records right now, your personal identifiable information, especially around healthcare, 
is probably on sale right now for $100, $180 right now. Pretty horrifying. In fact, if you, uh, if you, there are a couple of different websites. I'll give you kind of a little uh, public advisory at the end of this presentation on things that you can kind of do uh, to kind of secure yourself that kind of gets off a little bit of the AI track. But uh, I'm going to tie in all of this data and AI and why, why it's important to have AI. So the, the mega breaches, uh, that's the breaches that constituted to more than 50 million records being exposed and exploited. Uh, constituted an average of uh, $387 million. The global average of identifying a breach and remediating it averaged 277 days. Organizations that were able to respond faster to those breaches, identify them faster and close them down and walk away from that crisis in under 200 days, it's had an average of $1.1 million savings. Forty-five percent of the breaches were cloud-based as well. What can we do differently? The uh, the the term of insanity: doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, we've had a a model that came from the NSA in 1984 called Defense in Depth. Most of the organizations are still living based on the concept of defense in depth. The, the concept of defense in depth is that I would have different layering of security in my infrastructure, almost like a moat and a castle. Think of it in, in no, that context. So you have different layers. And if maybe the concept is if one of your layers get penetrated, then you'll have another layer uh, that would intercept or hopefully intercept those actors. And, uh, and then you have different layers. Well, we have breaches after breaches after breaches every single day. So defense in depth is not cutting it. We need to start doing a better job of acting, enriching, the insights of who's attacking us right at this particular time. How did they get in? That investigation and then orchestrating that on the response. This is how you reduce, well, you reduce your, your risk in being bre breached up front. You also reduce the time. Again, we saw just from some of the statistics that were released last week in the Poneman Institute. In fact, that report's available at no cost at ibm.com slash security. Anyone wants to reach out to me, I'm pretty much pretty public out there. My last name's Malori. You could just Google, you know, search me and you'll, you know, you'll see some access for me. Uh, you might even see my midlife crisis uh, band that plays around the Jersey Shore. Uh, I played last night. In fact, there'll be some videos on that probably in another few days when I get back on the East Coast. So, uh, so anyway, reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to, to engage with you and get you some uh, access to those reports. You, the uh, IBM Learning Academy, is, you can Google search that as well. If you're not even aware, the IBM Academic Initiative is out there for anyone that's using our, uh, our solutions for no-cost education. No cost, no licensing fees. You probably weren't aware, even aware of that. Your school should be aware of it. Your professors should be aware of that. Going back a little while, I don't know if many of you folks know that Watson was on Jeopardy. There's a really great YouTube out there, a documentary. I think it's uh, it's three part documentary, and it starts out very humiliating to the Watson engineers uh, from the beginning because they had some uh, some. Uh, preliminary producers of Jeopardy in the room, and they show you that all of this is on the documentary. That's all on YouTube. And uh, boy, you can see the facial expressions and the body language of, of these uh, producers and all uh, laughing at Watson coming up with its mistakes on how it was uh, arriving at answers for Jeopardy questions. Uh, this was in the beginning when, uh, when the questions were being typed in. So, uh, so the moderator was in uh, Jeff uh, Trebek at that point in the in the early in the uh, documentary. Uh, so, uh, 
they'd ask a question and someone would type in the question to uh, to Watson. And then Watson would come up and, it, you know, think about it. If uh, it was asked, uh, what's a computer bug? Uh, you know, it was thinking about bugs that were going into, you know, into the computers. So uh, now, but in, in that documentary, I don't want to give it all away, but at some point when they had voice recognition baked into the Watson AI, well, then it was able to pick up the questions very fast. It was also able to learn from the other contestants real time. So if it got, if it buzzed in and it came up with something, a tangent that was irrelevant, and then it would hear some of the other answers, well, then it started being a game changer. By the way, Watson did beat the world champions of, uh, of Jeopardy uh, on, uh, on television. And uh, I encourage you to take a look at that documentary when you have some time. Very cool. So we're seeing AI now advancing in user behavioral analytics, network behavioral analytics. So let's talk a little bit what the difference are between user behavior and network behavior. So user behavioral anomaly detection is something as an organization I would control. I would define the rules and the policies on what it should look for. I would define I would define how I'm getting that information. Typically I'm I'm extracting that or I'm uh, I'm aggregating that from logs in my own organization. They could be cloud logs as well. But these are the logs that are defined and I'm capturing information and I'm running analytics based on that and I'm looking for anomalies. So that's typically how it kind of starts out. And now you could throw AI on there and machine learning and try to really come up with where those anomalies are. But again, it's it's world according to you because it's the information you are able to aggregate. So if you're not aggregating something for a lot from a particular log, you have nothing to analyze. If you have a sophisticated administrator, that is a bad actor and may want to cover their tracks, they may go in and delete that log or they may shut down the logging temporarily for that machine. So that way it's not captured. Again, so the typically user behavioral anomaly detection is being captured based on what it's able to grasp. Network behavioral anom anomaly detection is not accessible. This is information that can't be tampered with. This is information that's coming down the pipe. And there's a lot of attributes that are associated with network traffic. We can see payloads coming through. We can see the bad actors. We can see the ground zero. We can see the patient zero for these things. Who these patient zeros are communicating to with network logging. When you put user behavioral anomaly detection and network behavioral anomaly detection together, well, now you can even see, identify when an administrator may even try to try to cover their tracks because we can see something here. And why don't we have it in the logs now? Now let's talk about, and again, we're using AI to actually look at both factors of that. Now we bring up step up on uh, step up authentication. I remember many, many years ago, American Express had step up authentication. This was a long time ago where you were able to call from your home phone number to get a, uh, a balance on your American Express card. And I remember distinctly the, uh, maybe the voice system saying, I'm recognizing you as calling from your home phone so uh, so you don't have to um, put in additional authentication information. This was years ago. Now they're still doing some of that stuff and you still put in some, some additional authentication as well as when you call American Express, because I know I called them a couple of weeks ago, uh, check my balance. So, uh, so that's step up authentication. And step up authentication would be that it would invoke you know what? You're coming in from uh, 
from this particular site. And I can see from the ISPs and the routers and the switches that are coming in, that you're coming in from, might be coming in from New Jersey. Okay, uh, that's fine. And then now I'm authenticating maybe from, let's say, uh, Connecticut. And maybe I'm authenticating maybe an hour and a half time difference between New Jersey and Connecticut. There's a possibility that I really drove quickly and I got to Connecticut really fast. Uh, more of an unlikelihood in an hour and a half, but there's a possibility. Who knows what maybe, uh, maybe I was on the fringe of one of those routers in New Jersey and really I was in New York but it kind of got picked up from New Jersey. So the risk scoring can change based on that because it can identify, hey, you know, that's from New Jersey to Connecticut. But now maybe I'm authenticating an hour time difference between New York or New Jersey and California. That may now really increase my risk scoring, my thresholds. So based on that, a lot of things can be invoked when you're using automation and advanced analytics like AI. So I could maybe at that point force someone for additional authentication credentials to supply me. And if I can't, then I'm going to say, probably not to say the right person. And I can invoke maybe, maybe automated things like auto disablement or containment of that user. Maybe I'll shut down that account. Now, when we were talking about that defense in depth from the National Security Agency, 1984, well, we might want to respond very quickly. You know, let's say that we know something's a ransomware attack in our organization. What do you do next? in your organization uh, is whoever identified that or was alerted, initially alerted, able to automatically disable that user? Are they empowered with even that, that access? You know, what if it's an executive at my firm? You know, am I going to lead it up to a security analyst that believes that that machine has been violated and, and they're going to lock out maybe the CEO or the CIO of my organization, the chief financial officer. They might be hesitant to do that. They may be hesitant to do that for anyone. They may not even be empowered to do that. They may more likely have to pick up the telephone to call someone else to say, look what I just found. To get someone else because these security departments and these folks that are working on individual security controls are typically very siloed. In fact, other Poundman Institute surveys came up with 70% uh, of organizations had more than 40 different security controls in their organizations, 40 different. And 70% of those organizations said they didn't think they had the right number that they needed more. Now, if you have 40 different security controls in your organizations, well, you might have 40 different people managing each of those security controls that have to work with each other. Or maybe you're lucky enough for a couple of these folks can actually wear a couple of hats on a different on a number of these security controls. But that's the situation we're in. So if you don't have automatic disablement and containment, and you know that there's a ransomware attack, by the time you reach someone to isolate that machine, you may have more machines infected and you, you may have a bigger situation than you started out with. Now think about it. If the algorithms already know that it's a ransomware attack on that machine, why not shut down every service on that machine in milliseconds or isolate that machine in milliseconds? Maybe you don't even want to shut down everything on that machine because then you lose all of the forensic information. So there's a lot of policies and decisions and rules that your organization should have before you're hit with a situation in a crisis. So they know, don't turn that machine off because we need to figure everything out. 
We needed to figure out what payload did that. How did we? How did he get in? But we, we certainly might want to uh, isolate the machine. But think about it. If I could maybe shut down some of the services that are running on that machine in, in milliseconds, mm -hmm. I might have a good shot that I could salvage 75% of the data on that machine before it's already been uh, encrypted or corrupted. So that's the value of auto disablement. And these things have to start working in tandem to one another. Defense in depth is just not good enough. We need security controls that work hand in tandem as suppliers and consumers to one another. When we talk about aggregating information from logs, we could think of a SIM. We particularly call our own an advanced analytics framework, not a, a SIM any longer because it has much more capabilities, but, but any security incident event management system that's out in the marketplace worth its salt should have at least the capability to see patient zero and who either reached that patient zero or where that patient zero communicated to. Anyone from the logs that you're aggregating. That's kind of what it's all about, a security incident event management system. But again, it's the world according to you and what you've been able to aggregate. When you bring AI into the picture, then it's able to not only look at what you are able to aggregate, but it's looking at everything external, everything you didn't even suck in to take a look at. And that could be your own data or public data. That gentleman earlier was starting to talk about a lot of that public corpus and everything. So AI is able to look at that. In fact, it could even go deeper into these bad actor zones and look at other things that these folks have done, the different payloads that are associated with these bad actor sites. And think about how valuable that is even for you to come up you know, once you clean up that mess and you get your op your operation back on track again, you're not done. You're going to spend a lot of time on root cause analysis to figure out how this never happens again. Think about all of this data that you're able to aggregate from these AI and the machine learning capabilities for that root cause analysis. Threat hunting is one of the latest, hottest, things right now. If you're looking for a job, you want to be a threat hunter. There's a lot of organizations that don't even have threat hunters right now, but they need them. These are folks that are looking at what's brewing. Let's say that I'm a life sciences organization and I got a whole bunch of folks riled up out there in the marketplace because maybe we do some animal clinical testing. Wouldn't you like to know if there's some folks that are really out to get you before they start knocking on your fences? You can see things brewing. You can start looking in the dark web for chatter. Think about what we're doing in military security intelligence. We're doing all of this stuff. We have been doing this stuff for many years. We've been aggregating information that's in the dark web and in the uh, just out in the public domain, even private conversations. We start looking at that. Well, we might even be able to unmask some of these folks. So based on the aliases that they're using, this is the way, you know, the old CSI, you know, crime scene investigators used to use push pins uh, on the wall with thread to try to figure out where the commonalities were. Who is the common person between these two kingpins for organized crime? And they can look, well, they both know this particular person. And then they start building up and, and looking at a hypothesis based on that. In fact, that gentleman earlier was talking about some of these AI graphs that are being used in military, law enforcement, and uh, in, uh, Security intelligence, even. 
you're when you're a threat hunter, you're looking for unknown unknowns. Now, this technology is the game changer for all of us going forward. It's called XDR, Extended Detection and Response. This is next level security. There's a number of big players that are in this space now. This will evolve. Some of them are in this space already where it's a bring your own security. So if you already have some of these other security controls in your enterprise, a lot of them are siloed. We talked about most organizations have over 40 siloed security controls in their enterprises. So that means that they're looking at different dashboards in their enterprise. XDR is able to aggregate all of the data from those different silos to bring that into a single pane of glass and act with the automated disablement, the automated containment. This is where it's going. There's a number of vendors out there that are delivering incredible things already today, but this is constantly evolving right now, XDR. And this is going to be the game changer for all of us. World according to me, not my organization, I think there's going to probably be a big shakeout uh, for the organizations that are delivering a lot of the managed services and uh, and a lot of the sophisticated tooling. I don't think that organizations, well, every organization will want the capability of the high tech solutions. Nobody wants to be breached, but they're not going to be able to afford it. So I think there's going to be a shift down the road where there's going to be a lot of big key players that are in the managed services organization. I think there's going to be a shakeout and that, that, that everyone will subscribe to these sophisticated security toolings. My last thing is going to be a help to all of you folks. You're going to walk away. And I'm, the reason I put this into my slide deck very quickly, and I'm out of time, but I want to tell you to save yourselves a lot of misery. These are the four credit institutions for the United States. Don't raise your hand, but think among yourselves. Have you gone to each of those four credit institutions and have you froze your credit reporting? You need to do that. I just got a phone call from someone's in-law, a cousin of mine. I was on the phone all night with them uh, telling them uh, the first thing you need to do is go to all of these things and lock them down. Now, if, if you don't have a way to ever remember your passwords, can't use the same password ever and ever again, over and over again. So use a password vault or a password manager, but use those four sites. Go to, take a picture of that. Go to all four of them. They're, they're going to require some kind of a pin that you're going to define. Don't use the same one over and over again. You're going to need a unique password for all of these things. You're going to need to unlock this at some point when you buy a car or a house or you know whatever, you, and you're not going to want to wait a week to get back in there so they could open up your credit reporting so that you can buy that car. So you're going to want to know what that password is. So get a password vault, a nice secured one somewhere, and put those passwords and those pins in that secured vault. So that way you can unlock it when you need to. But this is the number one thing that you're going to do when you think you've been breached, so why are you going to wait till you're breached to do it? Do it now. And that way, if you are breached, you don't have to worry about somebody stealing your identity, opening up credit. I've talked to a number of people where they said even children's social security numbers are being, uh, are being exploited. And these parents don't even know it until they go for student loans. They go for student loans and they're declined because they have an enormous credit already on them. And they're like, this is a kid. We never did that. These bad actors are stealing even babies' social security numbers. So even if you have a child, lock down their credit reporting. So I have a lot of these kind of things. If you ever want to reach out to me, if you ever want me to speak at your organizations, that's kind of what I do. 
I, I go on the road and I just volunteer for other things, you know, for everything. I spoke to uh, City of LA small business owners one night uh, about a month ago. So any folks ever looking for any volunteers, I'm your guy or I have a whole mess of folks at IBM that are happy to volunteer for no cost and uh, educate you. We have Cyber Awareness Month coming up. So every organization is going to do something. So think about reaching out to IBM. We are, again, the largest enterprise security vendor on the planet. A lot of people, you probably didn't even know that, but we are. Thanks for your time. I went over a little bit, so thanks. Thank you so much for your insight and uh, great presentation. Uh, there's so much awareness now about security uh, that we have to be cautious and be proactive about. Uh, thank you everyone for showing up. And uh, if you have any more questions, any questions? I'll be around for a little while if anyone wants to, to see me. Thank you. So probably next five, seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you.